This is a true story. It was 1977 and I was in the first year of junior school in the UK, having completed two years of infant school previously. Digital watches were the peak of exciting new wearable tech. Pocket calculators still came with mains adapters and like many boys of my age, I went to school clutching my Helix branded Star Wars pencil tin, eagerly looking forward to Christmas when it would finally be released here. The school had been a military hospital in a previous life and still retained its wood panelled walls and cavernous ceilings, which still had pulley wheels bolted to them for suspending the limbs of wounded servicemen in traction. The desks were time worn and utilitarian plywood and steel tube, bearing the scars of years of doodles inscribed with a point of compasses and preserved under thick layers of dark varnish. Infant school had been all about the basics of counting, reading and writing. Junior school was the first time we learned of subjects like geography, history and science. It was still just the one teacher in one classroom, but the week was broken up with talk of foreign countries, kings and queens, and why apples fell out of trees. Near my home were a couple of general second-hand shops. They were a wonderful cornucopia of useful household bits and pieces, appliances and furniture, that have long since left Britain's streets to be replaced with thrift stores and pawn shops. They also sold books, and in amongst the Conan Doyle, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Doctor Who novels I was always on the lookout for, were old encyclopedias. I could buy one with one or two weeks worth of pocket money and I loved their heavy glossy paper, the detailed lithographic illustrations, their rich embossed covers and the smell. I've always loved that second-hand book smell. I would stay up late reading these in my insomniac youth, ever alert for a parent's footsteps so I could turn out the light lest I should be punished for being awake past my allotted time. They were treasure troves of information about the world and I devoured them whole. My teacher, Mrs Gray, was well into a talk about how Sir Isaac Newton had used a prism to split light and discovered the visual spectrum. She talked of rainbows and oil on water and we messed around with water-based paints to see how primary colours mixed to make new colours. It was a fun subject and we all enjoyed the paint experiments. At one point I asked about Newton's efforts at alchemy and whether she could tell us any more about it. Her face darkened as she told me she didn't know what I was talking about. Newton was a scientist and that was that. Alchemy was nonsense and I was confusing the other children. She demanded angrily to know where I got this rubbish from. So I told her. I'd read it in an encyclopedia. It was really interesting and I'd learned about Newton's other achievements like the reflecting telescope, his laws of motion, and his life outside science as a theologian, member of parliament, and, of course, an alchemist. The more I said, the more furrowed her brow became, until suddenly she barked at me. Enough! I stopped mid-sentence and stared back at her, agape. How dare you interrupt my class with this, this hogwash! I felt tears starting to well up and my right hand starting to flap. But, miss, what have I done wrong? I said, enough! You know full well what you've done. Stop all this rubbish about alchemy and theology. You don't even know what they are, do you? Yes, I do. Alchemy is... Shut up! She screamed. One more word and you're going to the broom cupboard. By now, my emotions were overwhelming me. I was awash with rage, fear and confusion. I had no idea what I had done wrong. I thought school was about learning. I thought being bright and knowledgeable was a good thing. And I did know what alchemy and theology were. If only she'd let me prove it. I mean it. Don't test me, she shouted. My brain was a 
buzzing mass of energy, my vision a blur, and my hearing a rushing throb as all I could hear was my pounding heart. What the rest of the class saw was me screaming and wailing, smashing my fists into the desk with tears and spittle flying everywhere. Unbeknownst to me, Mrs Gray had shouted at me several times to stop before storming out of the room to get a male member of staff to deal with me. Mr Clark's shouting had no effect either, so he tried another tack. He slotted his hands under my arms and attempted to lift me, but I responded like lightning. My hands shot under the desk and grabbed the tubular rail underneath the desktop with a grip like iron. Mr Clark heaved, but the combined weight of myself and the 1950s desk was too much even for his broad shoulders. He beckoned Mrs Gray over to insist. 1970s gender roles be damned, there was no way he was going to be able to do this on his own. She reached under the desk to pry my fingers away from the steel frame, but she couldn't move them. My emotional tornado had locked my fingers into place and there was no shifting them. She stood up and locked her hands underneath my left arm, while Mr Clark did the same under my right, and they heaved with all their might. They got more than they bargained for. They lifted me and the desk came with me. The plastic tray I kept under the desktop fell out of the open back, spilling exercise books, pencils and several weeks worth of a small boy's pocket contents all over the floor. The class erupted in howls of laughter and screaming. Together, Mrs Gray and Mr Clark dragged me inch by inch to the door, the metal feet of my desk leaving parallel gouges in the waxed wooden floor. Finally, they got to the door and had to stop. They'd managed to get my shoulders out of the room, but the desk was still in the classroom and too wide to pull through. They tried to pivot me around to attempt the manoeuvre sideways, but my screaming got louder and my body stiffer. In the end, they gave up. They let go of me and left me there, sitting on the floor, my arms upstretched, still gripping the desk frame. Mrs Gray climbed over me to take control of the class, and once my screams had subsided, tried to continue the lesson. Apparently, it was about an hour before my hands slipped off the rails of the desk and I fell into a deep sleep. My parents were called to pick me up, and my next awareness was of being at home on the living room sofa under a crochet blanket. I remained off school for the rest of the week, whilst the head teacher and my parents discussed what was to be done with me. Questions were asked of my parents about the situation at home, and veiled accusations were made. My parents, in turn, punished me in anger at having been made to feel like they were failing in their responsibilities by nosy parkers in the school and the threat of social services. It was 1977, and nobody knew that the whole horrible scene could have been avoided. All the accusations and recriminations been unnecessary if they'd known what we know now. I was just an inquisitive, autistic boy who'd been told off for knowing more than the teacher had bargained for, hadn't understood what I'd done wrong, and been pushed to a meltdown that could have been easily avoided. Now, it's 2021. Let's hope we know better now. Thank you for watching. If you like this channel and you want to support it to make more and better videos about autistic life and culture, and gain exclusive supporter benefits, you can become a patron. You can join these official supporters and autistomatic buddies by following the link in the description. You can also subscribe on this link, watch another video on these, or visit autistomatic.com.